Welcome to Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoScheduleman.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. The question is, do you choose to believe that we live in a friendly universe or not? And maybe even a bigger question, why does the spell checker in any of the computer programs that I use underline the word positivity as if it's being misspelled or it's not a word? I think that alone gives us an idea of where things are. Try it. I wonder if I'm the only one that happens to. Welcome. I'm Kevin Bulmer. We're in the final of a four-part special edition series of Journeys with the No Schedule Man as we reflect back on the path of this project so far and take a few moments to recognize some of the key developments along the way. Over the last three weeks, we've explored some powerful principles, including possibility and just digging in and doing the work and figuring it out as you go with David Cicerelli of Voices.com. We talked about choice and the power of choice to shape your own experience with Sarah Westbrook. Last week, it was reinvention, the constant process that's going on. Whether you want to accept that it is or not, that was with my good friend and mentor, Gare Maxwell. In my opinion, this episode and its theme brings all those previous three principles and the episodes that went with it all together. It's what you want all of that to look like. It's the overarching principle that you'd like to follow, your default operating system, if you will. Going back to that question, do you choose to believe that we live in a benevolent world or not? If the answer is yes, then the choices that you make, the focus that you have, that reinvention I talked about, all the possibility, that all falls under that larger umbrella of positivity. Now, I found out through trial and a lot of error (laughs) that there's only one common denominator between every experience I've had or will have, and that, for me, is yours truly. You'll find your answer to that question by looking in the mirror. Nevertheless, when you are the only thing that's, your, that's consistent, wherever you go, whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're doing, it stands to reason that your worldview, your automatic thought, your assumption and belief about the way things are is going to shape your experience. It's funny the way it works out. When you tell yourself the world's a miserable place, you seem to see a lot of miserable people. And I have to admit, I used to be a little bit more like that. Okay, a lot more like that. But when you believe it's good and you believe that people are good and you're looking for good things, inevitably, you're going to find them. Case in point, after I had started this podcast and had established my rhythm and routine of looking for people I thought were interesting, positive, and creative, people that would have something to contribute to this show and the people that listen to it, those efforts eventually led me across the profile of a guy named Cornell Thomas. Now, I want to say I appreciate everyone I meet. I feel like I can learn something from every single person I come across. And I especially appreciate those who give of their time and of themselves to be on this podcast. But every now and again, somebody comes along and rockets into my life in a way that makes me believe that we must have been related or best pals in a former life or something of that nature. Because within moments, I can't imagine that I ever did not know that person before. Such was the case with Cornell Thomas. When I first connected with him, something magical happened I don't know how to explain. Every now and then it's just different, and talking with Cornell was one of those times. In the time since we connected earlier this calendar year, we've remained in touch, remained in touch. My sons know who he is. They both love listening to his podcast. My youngest son, Jaden, in particular, who is 11 years old at this time, absolutely adores him. He even noticed a street sign while we were on vacation recently that said Cornell Drive, and he ordered me to stop the car, pull it over, get out, and so that we could take a photo and send it to Cornell. When Cornell came into Toronto, Ontario on a business trip and had just a couple of open hours back in the spring, I got up at about 5 o'clock in the morning, drove all the way there to see him. It took me almost four hours, but it was just because I knew it would be worth my while to spend even a little bit of time face-to-face with him, just hoping that a little bit of his magic would rub off on me. And it has, because that's the kind of thing that happens when you focus on positivity and look for the good. 
And the time since we first connected, both of us have continued to accelerate in our efforts to make a positive difference in the world and in our community in general. So although it wasn't all that long ago that we did our initial episode, I just had to bring Cornell back to wrap up this special edition series and poise us to launch into the next phase of this podcast adventure. He's the only one that I've asked to join me to create a new segment together, and he's here with me now. Cornell, my Jersey brother, the Prince of Positivity, the big man, the king of the jungle, the man who knows right but can also go left. What is it that happened, in your opinion, when we first connected all those months ago? What, what happened there? Well, first off, thanks for the kind words, my brother. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm honored to call your family and yourself my family now. So I want to thank you for that. And I would say, and I say this a lot, Kevin, the great thing about this planet and I know there's so many things that are going on that, you know, are, aren't so great. But the great thing is, is that people like ourselves were finding each other. And if you would write it down on paper and say, well, how would Kevin Ballmer and Cornell Thomas ever meet? Like, how is that ever possible? You'd understand the power of God and the universe and the energy. So you let off this and anybody can tell they can listen to you for three seconds and tell you, you let off this vibe, this positive energy that people want to be around you. And I think that I do the same thing. So when we, co- we connected, it, it was just meant to happen. And when I was coming to Toronto and you said, hey, man, I'll come down and, and check you out and pick you up from the airport. And I was just like, I got to meet this dude, you know, and it was for a reason. So I was brought up on everything happens for a reason. I believe people come into your lives for a reason, both good and bad. And I think that we're finding each other. And there's this new movement coming on where if you just turn off the news for a little bit, you'll see some really good things happen. I know from your speaking and from your coaching, you talk to a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. That gives me a lot of hope, Cornell, because I just look at how my two kids respond to you and your ability to tell stories. And there was one time, it was probably a few weeks ago from the time that we're recording this, where I think that you were at a basketball camp. So your Facebook Lives that you like to do had kind of been pushed to the evening. Well, it was a Wednesday night. My boys were with me. My phone dinged. And I'm like, hey, Cornell's live. And my son, Jaden, was like, can we watch him? Can we watch him? <laughs> I said, absolutely. So we sat and, and we watched it together. And I, I, that moment and also the times where he'll sit in the car, kind of like his mouth hanging open, almost drooling a little bit because he's hanging on everything that you have to say. I became really aware in in that moment of your Facebook Live and we're literally sitting beside each other and and listening to you and watching you tell the story of how cool it was that as a father and a son, we're enjoying that together and that he is willingly absorbing this really positive content and seeing people that, quite frankly, Cornell, look different than the people that he sees every day and Mm -hmm. getting empowering ideas from him. And that really fills me with hope. And I'm wondering about how you feel about how young people that you see today are responding to the kinds of ideas that you just described and how much of what I just said about Jaden resonates with you. Yeah, well, first and foremost, as you know, Jaden's my guy. You know, that's my <laughs> – uh, I can't wait to, to meet both your sons in person. But uh, me and Jaden's got – we have this connection that is uh, that's special. So that's my guy. Uh, secondly, I'd say this. There's a different energy. I was on a on a show and someone asked me, you know, what's what's your favorite demographic to speak to? And I said, you know, it's not fair because everybody gives me a different energy when I go and speak. So when I when I'm around kids, especially Jaden's age and in high school, there's it's just something about it, Kevin. Knowing that I could possibly say something that they pass on to their kids and their kids pass on to their kids long after I'm I'm off this earth. It's something that sparks inside of me where I, I'll be honest, I have no idea where the words come from sometimes. You know, I, I believe in God. I believe that, you know, I'm just a vessel. And I think that, you know, there's times where, and I know you when you're doing your show, there's probably things that you say where you riff off something. You're like, where the heck did that come from? Like that didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about doing that. Like, or you're, you're doing a speech somewhere, Kevin, you just go off into a tangent. I do this all the time. And I have hope because these kids want something different. They want something different, my man. They, they don't want to be talked down to. They want people to empower them. And when you tell a kid that, look, you're responsible for the change that's coming up on this world, it doesn't matter what's going on right now. You are the next generation. You are at that next. 
it's up to you. It gives them this sense of hope. And I, I do my best to humanize myself in every story. I never start my story with, I'm so awesome, or, you know, I got a contract to play, whatever. I start the story with, dude, I was a baby deer. I was terrible at basketball. Kids used to make fun of me all the time. And this is what I'm doing now. So I think uh, me being able to humanize myself, being able to still connect with these kids and understand the power that they have inside of them that they might not even see yet, I think it gives me a, a special connection with them. Yeah, when I think about hearing you say that, I think about the anxiety I know that I had, especially as a young person and going into high school and whatnot. And you're always judging yourself and trying to measure up and trying to get the eye of the girl or the guy or whatever the case might be. And again, I'm thinking back to my son. And him. So like literally we drove to the grocery store and we stopped and he wouldn't let me turn the car off and go in until he had heard the end of the story. This was the episode of Population Unplugged where yep. you were telling the story about wanting to wanting to dunk when yeah. the, like in front of the school assembly or whatever it was <laughs> probably, in, the, probably. in the layup line and all the client and his just his eyes are lighting up like he's twinkling that so you're describing a you know a calamity an embarrassing moment <laughs> but we forget that that's the stuff that's that's authentic that we can all relate to that makes you more of a hero to him yeah. than if you had you know gone all Daryl Dawkins on it and pulled yeah. the backboard down <laughs> But that's the magic, isn't it? Just being real yeah. with people. Yeah, we, we we root for the underdog. And if you think about any movie that you love, any movie, Rocky, Weird Science, Goonies, anything, right? You root for the underdog because that underdog is in every single one of us. At some point in time, every single one of us was the underdog. It might might have been the underdog asking the girl to the prom. It might have been a sports situation. As you get older, it might be you start your entry-level job and you're the lowest person on the totem pole, whatever. So we root, we pull for that underdog. And man, Kev, I, the, the magic is, really is you never, ever look at yourself as anything but the underdog. You know, that doesn't say I, I have like a lot of confidence in myself and I believe in myself, but I'm always looking at myself like, hey, Cornell, you know what? You can get better. You can learn more. You can do more. And when you have that mantra – your work ethic never goes anywhere. I always tell people, I say, once you, once you feel that you've arrived, your work ethic starts to depart. So, <laughs> so I was, like the underdogs. I was just going to say, a wise man once told me, "You'll never arrive. I'll never yeah. arrive." And it's it, yeah. it that's it's an interesting thing when you realize that there's no ultimate top to the mountain. That once you get on that path of growth, that's it. That's your mindset. You're yeah. always growing. There's no period at the end of that sentence, and that's not to be frowned upon that's it's liberating it seems paradoxical doesn't it but it's really kind of the gateway to freedom i love it but i love it like you said there's no period at the end of the sentence you're just going to keep going your sentence ends when you're no longer here physically but even then if you're chasing significance and not success even when you're off this earth your story will still be told and your words will still be spread and that's the beauty of what we do so thinking about, there's some ties here. I'm going to get to the book in a moment because I sent you a picture of a cover of a CD that I did. Yeah. And at the beginning of that, there's an audio file from my grandfather interviewing me when I was probably three or four years old. He used to do these things that he called Gramps interviews. He had a cassette recorder <laughs> at his place. This is back in the 70s. And yeah. each time his grandkids would would visit him, he would interview us, and then he captured this on tape, and we've still got those recordings. And I've often thought, boy, you know, imagine if I could go back and hear and, and read and see more of what my mom was about, what my dad was about, what my grandparents were about. So every time I create a podcast like this, I think to myself, this is going to outlive me. And Eddie mm. and Jaden and someday my grandkids, they'll be able to go back and find out more about what their dad, their granddad was about. You're doing the same thing with Population Unplugged, sharing your stories and sharing your experiences. Tell me what that's been like for you so far. The first episode, Kevin, I, I'll tell you. And first off, my man Kevin here plays a mean guitar. So if you <laughs> have not heard this dude jam out, I mean, I was like, whoa. I mean, I figured that you could play. You don't make CDs for nothing. But I was like, this this guy is on fire. So that's one thing. You're like the white <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. Um, so that was the first thing. But – uh, for me, the first episode of Population Unplugged, I just remember looking at the microphone and saying, 
man, how do I generate the same energy from speaking? Because when you're, you know, as you know, you're a speaker. So when you go into a room, you get energy from the crowd. You get energy from the audience. You know, that pumps you up. But when you're just looking at a microphone, and for me, I don't, you know, I don't do interviews yet. I, it's just me and the microphone and, and my buddy AK. So I'm like, man, where do I generate this energy from? And slowly after the first episode, the second episode and third episode, then I start to get my rhythm. I'm like, okay, now I know how to do this. I'm just so excited to be speaking and knowing people are going to hear it. That's where my energy is coming from. And be able, for Bryce and Naya to be able to go back and see, man, Dad was like, that's why I started doing the 60 Seconds of Sanity on Facebook because I want to see, one, you know, we started it when Bryce was six months old. So for Bryce to be able to look back and see the old episodes, when he gets to become a teenager, be like, man, my dad was crazy. Or, you know, he was he was silly. And then when he has kids, like you said, man, you're just passing it along. It's just going to go all through the family. So it's beautiful, man. I get choked up thinking about uh, Bryce's kids watching me, you know, be silly with them and dance around the house on a on a video, you know. So it's it's just it's special for me. It's almost like a personal form of journaling that's completely naked to the world too, isn't it? Like you just yeah. you get to go back and hear yourself and I mean whether it's speaking or writing or whatever vocation that somebody is is embarking upon again playing into some of the ideas we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. I used to beat myself up so much Cornell on that it had to be perfect mm -hmm. or that I would I wouldn't get in the game to begin with or that I would get in the game and I would know it wasn't perfect and I just endlessly beat myself up far more than anybody else ever was as yeah. opposed to just you know going just growing part of growing means you're not going to be the same tomorrow as you as you are today and that's not only okay that's awesome that's how it's supposed to be and you can hear it in how a podcast or or uh, develops or how books develop or how your keynotes um come but and I guess you just described that, so that's not really very, very good question. It's not a question at all, which is probably why it's a good idea to do a podcast where it's just you talking. <laughs> but t tell me a little bit before we transition to the book, and then we uh, get back into the time machine and the conversation that we had before. Sure. Tell me about how how you came up with what is now Population Unplugged, the name, the format, the because it's just it. And Cornell, it's been awesome right out of the gates. It's just oh, bang you. on, fits you and fits your brand. But tell me what the thought process was that went into it. Oh, thanks, Kev. Uh, so one of my favorite movies of all time is The Matrix, the first one. Not the other two, but <laughs> the first Matrix with Keanu Reeves. And for you guys that, spoiler alert real quick, but for you guys that haven't watched The Matrix, Keanu Reeves is a is a guy that is thinking that the world is one thing and it's completely different. And this whole entire movie is his transition from a normal, average, regular guy to the one, to the person that is supposed to save this, you know, planet that is a, you know, he was living in a computer-generated, fabricated world. And now he's seeing the world for what it is, which has been destroyed years, thousands of years prior. So I feel the same way. I feel like there aren't so there aren't a lot of people that are awake that real that don't under, that they don't understand that man anything you want out of life anything you want to be anything you want to do is possible the problem is is that when you're stuck in this matrix when you're stuck in this rat race which might be your 9 to 5 job or your dead end relationship or you have people telling you that you can't do something it's hard for you to see it it's hard for you to see man anything is possible so i felt by saying population unplugged it's like taking the masses and just unplugging them out of the matrix and opening their eyes to bigger possibilities, that they can be more and that they can do more and they can help more. And so when I started riffing, it's like on population, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to start writing down different episodes about not just my life, but things that are going on. I think there are so many people that are afraid to voice opinions because they don't want to lose followers or don't, they don't want to lose fans or that's BS. You said it before. It's, it's about being authentic. I wouldn't feel right if I that's who I am. You know, if there's a problem. I'm going to talk on it. I'm going to speak on it. If that means that five people give me a bad review or don't like what I'm doing, then so be it. So I think it's given me a chance to really voice not only about my story and who I am, but to help other people in a practical way and say, man, these are some action steps you can take to live the life you want to live. Well, it's awesome. I, I I love it. I'll um, say a little bit more about it at the uh, the wrap up of this episode. It's um, it's it's absolutely perfect the way that it is. Usually somewhere between ten twenty minutes, 
you telling a story the way that you have this unique way of doing. And um, it's just, it's cool to see because when we had our initial discussion, that was something that you was still in development. You hadn't started yet. And now there's a whole body of work there and a growing audience. And, and I hope this can add to it. But let's, before we get away, and in fact, the time this episode is released, I'm not even sure where you're going to be, probably in an airplane somewhere, but you'll be over in England or you'll be out in L.A. or wherever it is that, that, that I know that you're going. But tell me about Extraordinary and how it feels to you to look on the cover of this book when you're sharing the thoughts and principles of everything that we've just kind of discussed here in the last 10 minutes and you see an image of your son on the cover. What's that feel like to you? It's it's emotional, you know. It's uh, you know, Bryce was born, um, you know, uh, June fourth, two thousand thirteen, at four twenty eight a.m. And I was in there, I was in the room by myself with him at first, and I remember looking down at him, just like you, you know, looked at your sons, and his whole life twenty years ahead flashed, and my whole life like thirty, forty years back flashed. And I just always knew I was going to be a father, and I always knew I was going to have a son first. And I told my wife that right when we found out she was pregnant, she thought I was crazy. And um, just being able to, to make something that is not going anywhere. You know, books have a self life, a shelf life of infinity. You know, so I know for a fact he's always going to be on the cover. And he doesn't. He's four. He doesn't get it now. But I think when he gets older and he realizes, man, my dad loved me so much to put me on this cover. Uh, that that's big. And the whole book, extraordinary, is all about mindset. And I got a chance to honor my mom in that book and write a chapter about her. And I also got a chance to, you know, be real with people. And I think there's a, a chapter in there called I've Been There. And it talks about all the struggles that I'm going through now, not 10 years ago, 15 years ago, not when I was trying to play basketball, but even now from day to day, some of the things that I have to go through that you would never know because I'm focused on the solutions and not the problems. So it was just really, it's a real book. And, you know, we got, I got Tony to, you know, endorse it, which was awesome. And uh, told me a lot about who he is as a person, and it was great. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's my proudest work to date, and I can't wait to spread it. Tony, he means Tony Robbins, not Tony the Tiger. <laughs> Although I'm sure it is great, but just for anybody that hasn't seen it, I thought I would drop that in for you, Cornell. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> or Tony Danza, who's the boss up in this Man, place? Next next book, I'm getting Tony Danza on there, and I'm going to find Angela. I forgot what her real name was. Yeah, just get him to throw in an A-O-O-A. I think that was yeah, yeah. Holy cow, man. We're dating ourselves. We can't seem to help from this. It was uh, Hammer Pants the last time, but uh, – Was it what? Ah, <laughs> uh, jeez. Um, it's all terrific. I'd love to talk to you for an I infinite amount of time, but we'll have many more conversations. Cornell, thank you for this. I love you. I appreciate you. you. And I wish you safe travels and, and all the success in the world with this book and, and everything else that's going on. And, and I hope that you know I'm here to support you always, however I can. Yeah, love you too, brother, and ditto. And your sky's the limit for you, and this is just the beginning. I can't wait till you get so big where you're. I'm having you fly me out to go to the Ellen Show and watch you on it. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, well, me and Jack and John and Bob and Tony <laughs> will go all come – Pick you up. All right. Right now, we're going to uh, we'll keep with one more 80s reference. We'll hop back into the uh, the time machine. Actually, I think this might be 90s. No, 85, I think, was Back to the Future. Look it up if you haven't ever seen that movie. You're missing out. Um, the DeLorean. It was a car that we could go back in time. So we're only going to go back to earlier this year, but the original conversation that Cornell and I had that started all of this, here it is for you. It started by me asking him about falling in love with basketball. Wow. So I fell in love with basketball when I was 16 years old. It's the first time that I ever picked up a basketball, and it was directly because my cousin, Carlos Taylor, I was in Virginia. We were visiting my mom's uh, family, and my family, and I looked under the bed, and there's about 100 newspapers, and my cousin was on the front of them dunking a basketball. And I just did some really simple math. I said, if I play basketball – I could be famous <laughs> because I had no idea that kids got into the newspaper for sports. So I wanted to be famous. And at that time, 
that was around the MC Hammer era. So I would I was like I was all messed up. I had hammer pants. I had like a a racer <laughs> haircut. So if I could do anything to fix my situation with girls, uh, I would do it. So I thought basketball was the answer. <laughs> You said you were messed up, but then you said you had hammer pants. It sounds all good to me. <laughs> it was great in 1992, and then shortly after 1992, uh, you had to you had to donate your hammer pants to the Salvation Army. Yeah, that was a well. What about three years past the bad boys, the Pistons yeah. play, and you can't touch this after uh, yeah. every win. But yeah, it was a little bit past its best before date. I guess 16 years old, isn't that? Yeah. Late. Yeah, thanks for yeah. saying that for me. Yeah, super late. Nowadays, kids are, you know, they're out of the womb and they have a basketball in their hand. You know, but I didn't, when I was growing up, Kevin, you know, my father passed at a, when I was really young, when I was about three years old. And uh, he passed away from cancer. He's a police officer in the city of Passaic. He did some amazing things in the city that I'll probably tell you later. But I didn't, you know, most boys, you know, want to be like their father. And my father, I found out later on in life, played basketball and all these things. But you know, I was raised a latchkey kid because my mom had to work three jobs since I was three and a half. So I never really got into sports. You know, I played baseballs in sixth grade for a little bit because my uncle told me about it. But then after that, I kind of just drifted. And then my, when I was 16, I found I found basketball and, and I fell in love. Tell me about what you liked so much about it, aside from the idea that that might get you in the newspaper and a few phone numbers from the opposite yeah. sex. <laughs> So the thing I loved about basketball is that you can practice it by yourself. And I'll be honest with you. I say this all the time when I go out and speak now. I say, you know, success is solitude. And there, in those moments of just me and the basketball and being terrible at it for the first four years or so and knowing that if I just put in enough work, I get better, that, those are like the special moments for me where it's just me and a ball and a hoop. So what were some of the things that you were doing to to get better? How were you drilling yourself? So I have uh, an insane work ethic, and it's directly from my mom. You know, my mom, like I said, worked three jobs, took care of five kids. One of my brothers is autistic, which, you know, is a whole other thing on top of that. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so I got to see my mom, you know, just through osmosis, I had to be a worker. Just watching my mom every day grind and hustle like she did. But uh, I'll never forget when I got back home from Virginia and I went to the, my local court, I was sitting there and I was throwing the ball at the hoop and I was absolutely terrible. And this guy just came out of the woods. You know, his house, I found out later, his house was by the woods. But he came out and said, hey, my name's Ray. Do you want me to show you how to shoot a basketball? And what he did that day changed the course of my life because he planted a seed in my head that I could get better if I worked at it. And it, it had such an impact on me. My first book, I have a chapter in it named Ray after him, after all that, you know, just for him giving me that time for two or three hours that day. When you're in your teens, I'm just thinking about this while I'm listening to you describe this, mm -hmm. Cornell. I mean, that's a, a challenging time for the best of us. A lot of things are changing and, you know, kids are off doing what they're doing. And I'm just thinking that at that time, there are probably high school teams that are going and there are people that are around you that are real, real good at, at basketball and, and at other things. And maybe I'm completely off track here, Cornell, and it, it's, it's happened before. Um, but, you know, was all that going on while you were still kind of like, no, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm behind these guys that might have been playing this for years, but I'm just going to stay on my own track and do my thing, and I know I'll get better. Yeah. So you're 100% right, Kevin. So, I mean, I had my buddies that played basketball. This wasn't their ticket. Right. So for me, there's no way I would have been able to go to college if I didn't have basketball. So my junior prom, my senior prom, I was watching the limousines drive past the court as I was shooting on the court by myself. So I just had tunnel vision. I just at, like I said, if I wasn't raised by who I was raised by, maybe I wouldn't have. Maybe I would have went to my prom or I would have maybe I would have went to these parties. But I knew that for me to be successful at, at the sport that I just started. I had to have this tunnel vision focus on all my dream, my goal, and, and that's what I had. What was the first instance that you can recall that it was starting to click and you were starting to have a little bit of success? Oh, uh, wow. Probably four years after I started playing. Four years? I was so terrible. I was terrible. I was god-awful. I looked like a baby deer. I was so bad. I mean, I, I was... My junior year, I sat JV in high school on a really bad team. 
my senior year, I sat varsity on a really bad team. And then when I got out of high school, obviously there are no colleges knocking on my door. I had to take a year and a half off and work two jobs just to afford going to a two-year college. And my freshman year, that two-year college, I probably averaged like six or seven points a game, which was four more than I've ever averaged in my life. And then my sophomore year, something clicked. And it was just the work ethic. It finally caught up, and I just never stopped. I think uh, in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he says, if you want to be proficient at anything, you have to put in 10,000 hours. And I believe like doing the math for me, it was about 11,000 hours before I got better at it. What kept you driving you? Because that's, <clears throat> that's, you know, especially for a young person, you know, you're talking mm -hmm. about, uh, what, a fifth of your life at that point yeah. that you're dedicating to something that you're telling me that you're terrible at. So if thinking about it back at that time, there had to have been self-doubts, but what kept you driving toward that? Well, the thing that drove me the most, Kevin, is I changed my why. And my why was, you know, to get girls and to be famous. And when I changed it to playing professional basketball so my mom never had to work again, that was all the drive I needed because here's someone that I love more than anything on this planet. And from just visualizing her never having to go to work again was enough to get me up early and have me go to bed late. That's a pretty good why. I was just stopping to consider that for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think we're going to probably come back to that and dive a little deeper into that, that whole well. But let's go back to you're in the two-year college, you're in your sophomore year. It's starting to click. Tell me more about that and what happens next. Well, it's funny. When you get better and other people stay the same, there's a whole different level of uh, animosity. So when I was terrible at basketball – People would just tell me I was bad at basketball, and that was it. And I never had to worry about anything, any jealousy or anything. So I'd go to the barber shop and it, you know, get a haircut. Here's the kid that's not good at basketball, and I'd walk out. But when I started getting better and I started getting some notoriety from it and I started getting in the paper all the time, I'd go to the barber shop and I'd hear stuff like, man, there was a guy in here last week that said he could beat you one-on-one -on -one and blah, 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 blah. And then I'd see the guy, and he never want to play. But, you know, it's just I started understanding that, man, the better you get, the harder you work at stuff, the more people might have a problem with it because there's not a lot of people that want to put that time in. So when I started getting all these accolades, it wasn't just you know, working on my own voice that I could do it, but just blocking out all the negative voices that were saying behind my back that I couldn't. So I tell people you know, when I go speak that you can never let negative words stop positive actions. And if you do, it's your own fault. How did you know to do that at that time? I was, I was raised by a lion, right? I was raised by an absolute lion. So my mom used to always tell me, you know, you hear the old ad, sticks and stones. My mom really didn't say sticks and stones. She would just say, you know, never listen to foolish people. And it just made more sense to me. I mean, yeah, ne never listen to foolish people. I mean, if there's someone saying something to you, the first thing you do is look at the source. Who's saying it? If it's not my mom or if it's not any of my family members that I care about or anything like that, like, why am I going to care? And that was, uh, that was a big thing for me. My mom's hit me with tons of nuggets growing up that, I've, that I still use today. But that was a big one. Like, look at the source. Who is the, who's saying these things about you and what are they, do they have any purpose in your life? And not, 10 times out of 10, that was no. Is your mom still around, Cornell? Yeah, my mom is um, 74 years old. I she probably punch me in the face when she finds out I just said her age. Want, but, me, to, want me to edit that out? <laughs> you might have to edit that one out, Kev, just to help me out. But uh, yeah, she's she's still she's. I mean, she was here yesterday. She was watching. I have a, me and my wife have two kids. Bryce is three years old, and Naya is one. And my mom was over here, and she just loves her loves her grandkids. So she was hanging out, and I know when my mom's here, they're gonna do anything they want. And uh, they're going to go to sleep at like midnight. So <laughs> it was it was fun seeing her. I was just going to suggest, Cornell, it's not that I'm not enjoying this conversation. I very much am. But uh, maybe I could extend an invitation to your mom to have a podcast because it sounds like she's got a lot of good stuff to share. <laughs> She'd be having unbelievable. She would have an unbelievable podcast. I would listen to it every single day and I'd crack up laughing because some of her analogies, Kevin, are they are. <laughs> I, I just get blown. She's a country girl. So. There's a farm animal in it. There's like you have no idea where she's going, but they all make perfect sense. Well, and 
we've kind of gotten on a bit of a different track here, but it's it's really cool to hear you tell the stories about her and to hear the obvious love and reference or reverence and respect in your voice. And that, you know, when it gets to, we keep trying so hard, looking outside ourselves to try to fix what maybe isn't broken or have what we think other people should have. And when you put it into the context of how your mom is, just being authentic, just being real, just being straight with, you know, never yeah. listen to foolish. Like sometimes it's just, it's it's a lot more simple. And I think what I'm getting at here, Cornell, is I'm hearing your mom as an example of that. It can be a lot more simple than we want to make it sometimes. Just use a little common sense and be yourself, right? Sure. You brought up such a great point. And I just did a uh, Facebook Live about it, I think yesterday or the day before. Such a great point. It It seems like in our space, Kevin, with what we do, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of people that they want to make you feel that you're damaged so you can buy like a $60,000 program. And it's whatever. You know, however you make your money, you make your money. But uh, we're not damaged, right? It's our mind. I go, I mean, I travel the world talking to people about mindset. It's your mindset. It's what you tell yourself. You know, it's it, you're not damaged. You're fine. It's just you don't think you are. It's like the kid that was chubby and then gets in shape, but then all of a sudden – you know, when he's older and he's in great shape, he still thinks he's a chubby kid, right? So your mind is your most powerful weapon. It, you can use it for good or you can use it for evil, but it, it, we're not damaged. And a lot of times you can be inspired within. You can be inspired by your inner circle. I'm inspired by everything. I'm inspired by you, I'm inspired by my mom, by everything that I see that, that is positive, I'm inspired by. So I think that's such a strong point for people to understand. Couldn't agree with you more. Along that track, you were you wouldn't have known this at the time, but your mindset and what you wanted to focus on was going to be put to the test. But how yeah. far along from that time where all of a sudden the barbershop people are starting to say, hey, so-and-so is talking about you, and you're starting yeah. to get some traction with the basketball, how long was it from then until you finally got that pro contract offer? Yeah, so it was about four years. So I got a uh, a full scholarship to play in North Dakota. Where I actually met my wife. She's from Seattle, and she played ball the same school I played at. So I was in North Dakota, played basketball. I was there for two years. Got back home. Uh, within six months, I got a contract to play in uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. So I was about seven years removed from first picking up a basketball to getting my to, to getting a pro contract. And I put in six, seven, eight hours a day. Like I, my wife would. I, it's amazing how she's still with me. I used to just drag her out like one o'clock in the morning. We'd shoot until three in the morning. Like it was just nuts. It was like something out of a movie. And when I got that contract, I was just so, uh, you know, when, like something comes to fruition that you've been, that's such a big reach that you believe in, but no one else believes in except for like one or two other people. It, I was like floating when I saw the message that I was leaving in two weeks, but a week before I was supposed to go, I was playing basketball outside with some friends, just not a you know, nondescript game, just messing around. And I went to go to the basket, and I heard a pop. And I fell to the ground, and I tried to get myself back up. I couldn't put any weight on my, my right foot. My friends came running over. Foolishly, I drove myself to the hospital, dragged my foot up to the emergency room. And this amazing, beautiful doctor uh, by the name of Dr. Bradish, he was meeting with me, and he said, Cornell, I'm going to grab the back of your calf muscle. If you feel excruciating pain, we have to do surgery on Thursday. And this is a Sunday. And that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Kevin, I cannot – I can't remember what happened. All I remember is that Thursday afternoon looking at my leg and having a hard cast from the middle of my thigh to the end of my toe on my right side. And then by that Thursday evening, having my contract voided out and canceled. Because I, the Achilles would have been a year, is, you know, was a year injury. So it was the one of the toughest moments of my life, and I felt like a failure. I felt like I let my mom down, which I obviously didn't. She didn't think that way, and I, I felt that I, I let down some of the people that helped me along the way, and I felt like I really left my let myself down. And when adversity happens, the first thing we do is right, we get in full blown why me mode, and I was in it. I was crying. My mom left, you know, kissed me on the forehead, and she was going to one of her jobs, and. I was crying and, and I just started thinking about her and I started saying to myself, you know, you were raised by a woman who was all about solutions and not about problems. And when the bills were stacked up to the ceiling 
and we couldn't pay them, she'd figure something out. And when our lights would cut, get cut off or our hot water would get cut off, she'd always figure something out. And here you are, you have an Achilles injury that's going to get better. You know, figure it out, dude. What are you going to do next? You know, so that helped me pick myself up and go on to the next thing. And, you know, my mom was an expert problem solver once my father passed. And I think she passed that on to all of her kids. There's a lot that we could explore in just that last couple of minutes of of an answer that you offered, Cornell. Uh, you know, you went from the highest high yeah. to one of the lower lows that you'll experience within um, a really short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And you just described going into the whole why me mode, which who could blame you for that, but then also comparing yourself with your mom and trying to get your mindset back. But if you can think back to when that was and when you really knew you were in trouble and the the contract was voided and you knew what the injury was, Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about what was going on then before the search for the good side of it came along. Maybe it came along quicker than I think it did, but yeah. that's a, that's a heavy drop, man. Right? Like what, what were you thinking where you were, where you were laying there? Well, honestly, Kevin, I was thinking that uh, my career was over and I was thinking that life isn't fair. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I'm good to people and I get this injury. So you curse the heavens and you, you just, you know, I let it all out. The difference is, is because of the way I was raised, I had a day of that. I didn't have a year of that or months of that or hours. Of, I had a day where I was just miserable. And then that Friday, that next day, I was on the phone with my friend telling him that he has to pick me up in the gym on Monday morning. And I ended up shooting from a chair for six for the next six months. So, uh, you know, people talk about the advantages and disadvantages and my father passing uh, transformed my mom, and in that transformation, uh, she transformed us uh, into, you know, like I said, expert problem solvers, and just our minds are lo- they work a little bit differently than most. The more you're telling me, the more I want to meet your mom, Cornell. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully you will one day. Hopefully she's she's an amazing woman. Well, I would I would love to do that. I'm I don't mean to sound naive about this, but yeah. Um, was there not a thought at all of, well, I can heal and, and get back into it and maybe get another contract? Yeah. And I got, you know, and I started working and I started, you know, training and I got back and, and as I got, went to a pro camp in Alabama and, you know, I started coming back and the next thing you know, I got a offer to coach basketball at my old junior college. And I denied it, said, no, I'm 26 years old. I got plenty of time, blah, 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 going on, going on, going on. And it was my old coach from junior college that said, Cornell, you know, just come in for an interview. So I reluctantly went on, went in for an interview. The next day I have an orange whistle around my neck and I'm looking at 15 kids calling me coach. (laughs) Well, it seems like a, a good spot for you. And I was going to ask you know, from the time in the early 2000s when you got the contract offer and the injury to when you've described on your website, it was around 2010 you decided that you wanted to start a new movement and 2011 that you really realized what your true purpose was. I was yeah. going to ask you, what was going on in that almost decade in between? And it sounds like you just gave me part of it. Yeah, it was all hoops. I mean, I was... I, you know, at a junior college, usually the clientele are second, third chance kids, right? Kids that, you know, are at a four-year school, didn't make it or didn't have the grades to go to a four-year school. And so I was Coach Carter before Coach Carter ever came out. I mean, I was kicking guys off teams. I was going to their classroom, making sure they're in there. I mean, I was doing everything for 10 years. And after two years of coaching junior college, I, I opened up a, a business, my first business called Crossroads Basketball. And I started working with kids. And I had kids from anywhere from, you know, fifth grade to high school. And, uh, you know, I started doing this travel, these travel teams. So I had junior I had basketball from September to, you know, end of February for college. And then March till the end of July, I had my travel teams. And then I'd have a month in August where we do summer camps. I go right back into basketball. So my whole thing was, is I want to be this division one head coach. And right before my firstborn, right before Bryce was born, 
I had another shift. Well, don't stop there. <laughs> I'm, wait, I'm, wait, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you to tell me more. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsor. Yeah, you know? yeah. We're just gonna, we're gonna cut out here for for a minute and see if we yeah. can sell you something that you don't need with a commercial. That's what the world needs more of, for sure. Uh, around when was this? Like in, chronologically, what year was this yeah. happening? So this was 2000. Uh, my son was born uh, 2013. So this was um, around, I'd say March, 2013. I was, I was sitting on, I was sitting on my computer. I was going on Facebook and for whatever reason, I don't know if it was close to an election or what, but it was the most negative stuff I've ever seen on my Facebook wall. Like it was absolutely Kevin more negative than it usually is. Just absolutely crazy. It was like a full moon the night before. And so I'm like, Holy crap. I was like, this is nuts. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I have this book called Book of Positive Quotations. I'm going to take this book. I'm going to take out a quote. I'm going to put it on Facebook every morning when I wake up. So the first thing people see is something positive and cool and like nothing negative or you know, hurtful. So I started doing it. And about three, four months went by and I woke up one day to get the book out and put post a quote and I couldn't find the book. So I'm sitting there and I'm freaking out and I made my own quote and people still liked it. So I was like, oh, screw the book. I'll just make my own quote. Do you remember what that was? No, I wish I did. I remember my first blog was, which was horrible, but I (laughs) I don't remember my first quote ever was. I know I can go back in the Facebook um, archives, but I I wrote it and people like probably like five or six people liked it. It was like me, my mom, my wife. And uh, (laughs) As I started going, you know, I just I, I didn't like, you know, tag myself, you know, quote by Cornell Thomas. I just, you know, wrote my quotes. And so about six months in, uh, a buddy of mine comes up to me and goes, dude, where do you get your quotes from? And I was like, you know, actually, I make the quotes myself. <laughs> and and uh, he goes, you should write a blog. And I said, that is a fantastic idea. What the hell is a blog? <laughs> and he, I had no idea. And he goes, well, let me write one up. So he, he did one. At, uh, we are Panera Bread in Rockaway. And he wrote up this blog on this WordPress site, did this WordPress site, and I wrote my first blog, which was called Risk. And every Saturday, I started doing a blog. And uh, I, I said, you know, I want to write a book. So I wrote a book. And it was, my first book was The Power of Positivity, Controlling Where the Ball Bounces. And after I wrote the book, I was like, well, you know what? I want to speak. I want to go places. I want to I go and share my message. And I realized that if I was a Division One head coach, I'd never see my kids. My, well, my, my son at that point. And I was like, Growing up without a father, I would never subject my son to that. I would never not be in his life. So I started speaking and writing, and thanks to the power of social media, I've been able to travel all over the world and just sharing my message. Here's a really interesting thing that I wish I had figured out, Cornell, decades before I did. Mm -hmm. Is there's a pattern I'm hearing to some of the story that you're telling is that you had kind of an X on the map where you thought your treasure was. So it was at first it was basketball and then it was going to be being a division one coach. And even though those things didn't come to fruition, those were the things that, that started pulling you forward. Yeah. And, and having you like sort of, sort of like your North star that, you know, you're following across the desert. Mm-hmm. And then, so when you talk about, well, the basketball went away with the injury and how devastating that must've been, but then you almost immediately pivot to where I'm imagining you <laughs> with those kids passing yeah. along your genuine character, what you've learned from your mom and others and empowering yeah. those lives. I'm thinking to myself, well, of course, not that there's anything wrong with being a basketball player, but you could probably make more of an impact mm-hmm. by being with those kids. And then, you know, to go on and be a coach, certainly you would have had a big impact there. But what you mentioned about with, with your family and then now being able to take that all over the world, it's a really cool thing, isn't it? How you keep moving forward, you you know you you pick something to chase after to keep you moving, but you've got to be flexible enough also to be able to show be shown those open doors and be willing to walk through because you just you never really know why until you 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 cross that bridge. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that and that's so true. I mean, I I tell people that sometimes you got to go through pain to find your purpose. And that's just real talk. I mean, people don't want to fathom that they have to go through something hard to figure out why they're here on this earth. 
you know, I had someone interview me a couple of weeks ago and they're like, well, what, what's your mission? You know, what's your, I was like, well, my purpose is helping people realize they have one. Like that's why I was put on this earth to sh- showing people how talented, how amazing they are. If they actually put the work in and start believing it. So you're right. I mean, I, I always find a way. My mom loves this story. I, she was in this uh, group called uh, Weight Watchers a long time ago. And she left the group and she had about a hundred of the nastiest tasting chocolate chip cookies that have that have ever been created. <laughs> ever. The Keebler elves would be like they would be ashamed. <laughs> and so I look I'm looking at this box and I'm starving. Like I was in sixth grade, I was starving. And I'm like, Mom, what are you gonna do with those cookies? And she was like, Cornell, you cannot eat all those cookies. And she knows me. She's like, You cannot eat all those cookies. I was like, Ma, I just want the box. Can I have the, the cookies? And she said, Yeah. And so I said, Okay. So I took the box, I walked upstairs. I put on my baseball uniform and then I walked door to door and I sold every single cookie for a dollar. <laughs> and I come back in and my mom goes, where were you? I said, well, I just went door to door and I just sold them. said I was out making like doing a sale for baseball <laughs> and I sold all the cookies and I emptied the box. I was like, there's nothing left, but I made $50. And my mom just, she just smiled and like patted me on the head and she goes, I never worry about you. And she just started laughing. Like, she's just like, you're just, you know, I'm resourceful. You know, I just I figure it out. Okay, man, I'm hungry. There's 50 of these disgusting cookies. I have a baseball uniform. Maybe I can go out and sell these things. You so, know, that was my lemonade stand. I'm wondering what your sales pitch was when people answered the door. It was, it was, not, it was not truthful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few times I'm betting that uh... – <laughs> that, that you employed that tactic. Yes, it was one of my few uh, non-authentic uh, sales pitches ever where I was just like, yeah, we're raising this thing for my baseball team. They're like, oh, sure, give me five cookies. And I'm like, thank you, I can order a pizza. You know, and I'm just going from door to door. So it was, uh, I'll never forget that story. When people talk about entrepreneurship and I, I don't think, I think it's really cool to say you're an entrepreneur these days. Like a, it's like a cool thing to say. But the work, the amount of work you have to put in to be, to truly be one and to keep your head above water and the creativity that you have to have and the belief you have to have, um, it's not a, it's not a pretty battle sometimes. It's, it's a lot of hard work and, and, and hustle. Where was the, or what was the point, Cornell, where you feel like you kind of transitioned away from being a coach or maybe you still consider yourself a coach or, or still doing that, um, yeah. to, taking some of these things that you were investigating, like the blog and then the book, and it doesn't sound like you'd quite got to the speaking part of it yet, but what was the point where you started to, to think of yourself kind of as an entrepreneur? Well, when I opened up Crossroads Basketball, you know, with the coaching, so I coach people now on two different ways. I coach, still have my basketball business, but I also coach people and consult people one-on-one, and it's a lot, a lot of it's overlap. It's some of the same stuff, but when I opened up Crossroads Basketball, I ran my first camp, Kevin, and I bought, I'd say, 100 shirts. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, Kevin Costner, if you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm good at what I do. I got a pro contract. People are going to flock to it. So I hired, like, five counselors and had my 100 T-shirts, and I had this, like, little simple logo. And the camp came, and three kids showed up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, Kevin Costner is so full of crap. Like, <laughs> what was he talking about? Like, what, like, what is happening? And I realized that you can build whatever you want, but if no one knows about it and you don't work hard for people to understand it or know what you're doing, it's not going to work. So I think I had that entrepreneurial mindset already and some of the things I was learning from that, from uh, basketball, my coaching business. And then as I got into this space where I've been you know, writing and speaking and, and coaching and doing a, a whole bunch of different things, uh, man, it just it fits my, it fits my personality. I have a crazy, just dumb amount of energy, even with the three-year-old and the one-year-old running around the house. I have a crazy amount of energy, and I'm just I'm I, I'm so fueled up by my purpose. Like I do believe that this is what I was meant to do. Uh, that I, I just I'm nonstop. Like I can't, I can't wait to go on to the next thing. I can't wait to do the next interview with someone that's cool like you. I can't wait to you know speak at the next. But I mean, next week, Kevin, I have four keynote speeches. Four in a week, <laughs> like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, in a, in a week. And I, I just can't wait. Like I've spoken three times in one day. Like it doesn't, I'm just nonstop. I'm just, I just love what I do. How did you do that? Like when you got interested in exploring speaking, 
Mm -hmm. crafting what you're going to say, finding the core message, knowing what audience to go to, and then reaching out and doing the the hustle, like you say, to connect with people. And who's calling me again? What's sure you got a a good message, but why should I listen to you? What were some of the things that you were doing to, to get traction in that world? Well, it's funny. When I first started, when I decided I wanted to go out and speak, a friend of mine that I used to work out with, she said, Cornell, you have a lot of like, you know, cool stuff. You're coming out with a book where you come out and speak to my group and she worked, ran a dance studio. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I was like, I'm thinking to myself, like, I guess I can tell my story and then go from there. And I can tell my story about, you know, being in third grade and, you know, not knowing what I wanted to be. And I kind of like, so a story was formulating. So I get to this dance studio. There's 10 people. They're all eating, which is the worst case scenario. And uh, my whole entire thing was, I want to be so impactful that they stop eating midway through. And midway through, they stop eating. And my very next speech, Kevin, was in Las Vegas. I cannot make this up. It was at the Palms Casino in front of 200 chiropractors. That was my very next speech. From 10 people, dance studio, everybody eating, to 200 chiropractors. Because when I started blogging, there were people that were like, hey, would you write a guest blog? And I met these guys that had a brand called Ula. And they were like, we're doing this event in Vegas where you come speak. So they had no idea that I've never really spoken before in front of anybody. They had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't know what to charge. I flew, flew myself out there. I bought 100 books. I was praying to God that I'd sell at least 50 of them so I can make my way back and not have to wash dishes or whatever I have to do. And um, I got there and I spoke. And after I did, you know, did my 45-minute speech, they came running up to me, gave me a hug and said, how long have you been speaking for? And I said, oh, about 45 minutes or so. <laughs> and uh, they just started cracking up laughing. They're like, you felt so natural and, you, you know, you look so natural up there. I said, well, I'm not telling you anything that's not true. So I started from there. I started just taking that speech because when I talk to speakers about people that want to get into speaking, I said, you have to have a fastball. And your fastball is wherever you go for the first time. People don't know who you are. You should have a story about yourself where it's your fastball. You know, you throw that, you throw that a million times. Eyes closed, upside down, it doesn't matter. And you can flow so easily and freely in this fastball that you can change it the night before. You can change it. The, like I've changed my speech 10 minutes before I was supposed to go on because I, I heard a quote or someone said something and I went to add something to it. So my fastball, I work on it all the time. Like I'll be driving and I'm, I'm working on my fastball. I'm in the shower. I'm, you know, wherever. I'm working on my fastball. So I, I just practice a lot. And I, and I just do it in random time. So whenever I hear something that's inspiring, I have a, a notepad in my phone. Uh, one of the things is just called, you know, one of the folders is called thoughts. And whenever I hear anything that inspires me, I put it in my phone. And some of those thoughts have become speeches and some of those thoughts have become closers for speeches or openers to speeches. So I'm just always looking for different ways to help and inspire people. What was the crux of the message when you were in Vegas that first time? Yeah, so the crux of the message was you're going to get punched in the face by life. <laughs> what are you going to do when you get hit? That was pretty much the crux of the message. Like all the things that I talked about, and I talked about a little bit about, you know, when you have your business and all that stuff, but the bottom line was life is going to punch you square in the mouth at some point. What are you going to do after you get punched in the mouth? And I'm just so real. Like I don't. You know, when I talk, I, you know, I know there's plenty of amazing people that, you know, they do videos and they're on a mountain and they're, you know, they're lighting incense and they're, you know, that's just not me. I'm just not that dude. When I talk about positivity, I don't tell people to forget about human emotion. Like we're human beings. Of course, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. Positivity isn't the absence of those human emotions. Positivity is just not living in negative emotion. So I'm just very different. Like I'm, it's almost like an every man's guide to positivity because I'm just, I just shoot it straight from the way I was brought up. All the things that we hear, they've been said before. I'm looking at a Napoleon Hill book right now. This is 1902, like 1902, As a Man Thinketh came out, you know, like, and it's the whole entire, the book, The Secret, it's As a Man Thinketh. It's just rewritten, right? So all these things have been said since the beginning of time, but I realize it's the messenger, you know, that we are what make it different, you know, so I just started really throwing my story into my message and then it started getting a lot of traction. <laughs> so you roll up into Las Vegas, 
in front of a couple hundred chiropractors, I think you said? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you tell them, hey, everybody, great to be here. I'm Cornell Thomas. You're going to get punched in the face. M- maybe it was a little different than that. I'm just ge- <laughs> pretty much. It's it pretty I, much that. It's pretty much that. Well, what was what was you know? Because like part of what they teach you in this industry is to is to really match up your message with your audience, right? Sure. And one of the challenging things about positivity and mindset is that it's like, well, it's it's for everybody, and it is. But um, how did they react to you at first? They loved it. Yeah, they loved it. From that from that speech, Kev. I met a very good friend. He's a very good friend of mine, a mentor now, who f- flew me out to Wisconsin, Jay LaGuardia. And then I met a woman in Michigan that flew me out, Kathy Patton. She flew me all the way out to Lakeview, Michigan. And I spoke three times. And that's one of the places I spoke three times in one day. So whenever you go speak, you should be so impactful that either someone from that audience hires you right off the bat or they, they refer, you know, there's a ref, you know, referral about you to someone else that want that can hire you, and that's my whole goal. Like I wanna, I wanna go everywhere. I don't want there to be a, 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 a inch of the earth that I haven't gone and spoken at. So that's what you know. That's what's happened. Whenever I go speak, someone says, "Hey, can you speak here?" And you know, now I actually charge for it, which is pretty awesome because that means I can pay pay for diapers, <laughs> and my wife will kick me out of the house. So that's really cool. Uh, so it's just uh, it, it's just in me. You know, it's it's really in me. My mom when we were growing up. You know, the kids at her church, we'd have to do like little speeches in front of people. And like basically we'd read a couple paragraphs from the Bible. So I don't have any like, oh, my God, I'm going to give a speech. I don't care if it's five or five thousand. It's nothing changes for me. You know, I don't look at that. I don't like, you know, feel that pit in my stomach and think it's nervousness. I feel that pit in my stomach and think it's, I think it's excitement. I'm like, man, dude, you must be really excited to go out here and make it happen. So I just my mind just works different, you know. I just I love what I do, and uh, you can put a million people in front of me. I'm I'm just gonna kill it, just like I would if there was five. What's going on for you? I'm going to say behind the scenes, Cornell. But what I mean mm-hmm. is, unless I miss my guess, you're constantly feeding yourself new ideas. New well, mm-hmm. you mentioned it with keeping the the, the journal of thoughts in your phone reading books, you know, looking for new mentors, looking for new ideas, just looking for anything positive. What's that like in your world? Yeah. Well, the good thing is I don't have a nine to five. And I figured out a long time ago that I, I'm not good with having a boss. <laughs> I'm very, I'm really not good. I mean, my book might might not have been called The Power of Positivity. It might have been called The Power of Something Completely yeah, Different. Yeah, it would have been called yeah. You're Going to Get Punched in the Face. <laughs> What are, you go- yeah. what are you going to do when, it, when you get hit? <laughs> so I, I found, I, you know, I realized, you know, what I, what I don't want to do. And I think uh, a lot of times people don't, they're running this rat race, Kevin. So they don't have time to sit down and understand, you know, what their purpose is because they, they're doing something they don't love. So yeah. if you have time, you can sit back and say, you know what? I don't want to do this so I can stay away from these things. And then I can concentrate on this. So every day, like I'll wake up and every day is different. Like today, I got up at 4.35 a.m. My wife is uh, in Florida. She's for the first time in, since my son was born. She's getting a two days away from, from the family, which she was freaking out about. But I said, hey, please leave because it's going to be better for all of us. So uh, she's in Florida with her friends. Get up at 4.35 in the morning. I, I get on my, you know, do my quote of the day, get on my computer uh, start doing, you know, a little research. We had a positivity summit this past weekend. So going over that, you know, just going over the notes for the next one in Toronto. And then I, you know, read a little bit. And then I had a, I had to speak. I did a social media talk at a land rally uh, in uh, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Did that for an hour. I was on, on a panel. Came back. I knew I had you in, in about an hour once I got home. And then looked up some more stuff, answered some more emails, did a Facebook Live. And now I'm with you. It's interesting for people that talk about not wanting to necessarily have a boss. Mm. I think it would be easy for people to view that as, well, they don't want to work hard. But it's, it's yeah. actually it's the reverse of that that's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, you're, trying to, sure. you're trying to take this racehorse and just give it a little stable and say, there, go ahead and be happy. It doesn't work like that. No, you can't put me in. If you put me in a cubicle, I would I would run out the building. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot be caged up in a cubicle like I can't. I can't, you know, I, 
I always say to people, like, it's hard to match my work ethic. And that's why one of the hardest things for me in, in my journey uh, as I'm, as it's getting bigger and bigger has been to delegate. And it's such a special word that I need to embrace and say, Cornell, you know, once you get to the point where you can get a team around you, delegate. So you can focus on reaching the masses and they can maybe take off one or two things because I'm so used to doing everything myself. I mean, my second book was called The Power of Me, Army of One. <laughs> it's for a reason. I mean, obviously, my wife is part of that one. But I'm just used to just taking the bull by the horns and saying, whatever has to get done, I'll do it. If it's cleaning the floors, it's cleaning the floor. If it's whatever, I don't care. Whatever has to get done, I'll do it. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, – I don't, I don't think a boss would be able to push me as hard as I'm going to push myself. How do you reconcile you when you see and are around people that you know and that you love – or some people that you've never met before, but mm -hmm. you can, let me give you some, I'll, I'll finish this thought first. When you realize that they're just looking at life through a different lens mm -hmm. and it's a lens that isn't really serving them and they don't want to see, I'll give you an example. Just this morning, uh, one of my colleagues and some other work that I do, he, he came to me and he goes, um, Hey Kev, it's Friday. I said, yeah, I guess it is. He goes, don't you <laughs> wish, don't you wish uh, Monday could be more like Friday? And, <laughs> And my inside voice is saying, no, not really. Like, <laughs> they're both good, aren't they? They like, are you any less alive one than the other? And he didn't stick around for me to, to respond. Yeah. He just kind of laughed and, and left. But the psychology of it is like, thank goodness I get to put down what I'm doing and, sure. and, and get a bit of a break. And I used to listen to stuff about what people say, you know, love what you do and, you know, you'll never work a day in your life. It's not about not doing the work. It's yeah. about being fully engaged and having that positive mindset. But I just, I wanted to tell him because I, I, I love him. You're, man, you're like, eh. I know what you're thinking because I was like that until fairly recently, but you're doing it wrong. Like, yeah. but you don't want to be pushing on anybody that's not, um, I'm flying all over the room here. I'm going to get punched in the no, face, I, and I it, deserve it. But it, you know what I mean, right, about that it almost – there's an interesting thing that you become more connected with the energy that binds all life together, but you also kind of get pulled a little bit separate as well. How do you sure. deal with that? Yeah, I mean, Kevin, as you're speaking, I'm just nodding my head yes. Yeah. I get exactly where you're coming from. And understand, our mindsets are rare. We're not normal, and thank God we're not. Because, well, I always knew that, but just not yeah. in this way. <laughs> I figured I'd do a little intervention and let you know if you didn't. Thanks, man. But nor normal people don't have podcasts, right? Because it it's you're putting yourself out there. You know, you're putting yourself out there to be judged. You're putting yourself out there to be critiqued, right? I mean, there's – I mean, it's Kevin Bulmer Enterprises. It's like, you know, it's on you. This is your name, right? So I know off the, right off the bat you don't think – like everybody else thinks. I th I th we, we live in a land of sheeple. You know, I, I really do think there are billions of sheeple that just follow the norm. And, you know, everybody hates Monday, so I'm going to hate Monday. And blah. Man, dude, if you do what you love, the days don't matter. I, I forget which day is which because every day is freaking awesome. That's yeah. not saying I'm not going to have a bad day or I'm not going to have a bad moment, right? But it's just saying that, like, I love what I do. So I'm not looking for Friday. If you're looking for the for the three days, and not even you can't even really count Sunday, because Sunday you're thinking about Monday if you hate your job. But if you're if you're if you're missing out on five days out of the week, man, that to me that doesn't make any sense. That's a I mean you have 168 hours in the week, no matter what. T not taking out sleep, you have 168 hours. That's it. You're gonna take more than half of those hours. And be miserable because you don't like where you are. I don't get it. I'm sorry. If that's being normal, I'm great being an alien. I'll be an alien for the rest of my life. What's you know? You know what? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, yeah. You mentioned ten minutes or so ago about some of the material, like as a man thinketh. Sure. Uh, we talked about Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. One of the ones I've been reading a couple pages of every single morning when I wake up is uh, The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles, which is from, like Ooh. I don't know, the 1600s or whenever. My point yeah. about it is that these ideas have been around and have been proven yeah. for a long, long time. So why is it still so rare? Because people don't do the work, Kevin. People don't do the work. 
you you research, man, what, what, what I learned from this? Who's this? Let me check this out. What's this thinking grow rich? Napoleon Hill, what's this about? There, we, we, there's a lot of lazy people. There's a lot of entitled people. They don't do the work, right? They don't get up early and go to bed late. They want everything handed to them. They want to be, you know, spoon fed. And that's the problem. And, and, and that's why when I go and speak, I, I mean, that punch in the mouth is usually coming from me. And I'm not talking from a, a pedestal. And like I said, everybody has their moments. But I live what I speak about. Like you live what you believe. You know, so we know how hard, how much work you have to put in to be successful. I'm not even close to where I'm going to be. Give me a couple more months. It's going to get scary. You're going to be like, wow, this guy, Cornell, holy crap. He he said he's going to be here. Now look where he is. Right? I'm not done. Like, I'm not even close. Like, I'll never arrive. I say it all the time. Once you arrive, your work ethic departs. You never arrive. You're always working towards being a better version of you. I don't want to be the next Tony Robbins. I don't want to be the next Les Brown. All I want to be is a better version of Cornell Thomas every single day. And if I do that, there's going to be some amazing things that I'm going to do for this earth. You just hit on one of the magic answers that I didn't know that I needed to have. Let me throw this into a bit of a different perspective for you. Um, because my experience, Cornell, was it wasn't a lack of curiosity or a willingness to accept new ideas or anything like that that was my downfall. Mine was that um, I was working hard and I was really driven to achieve certain goals, but I was looking for happiness more as a result than a choice and a state of being. And I was mm -hmm. sure that I was right with what I was doing and I didn't even know that I was missing out. And it took for me kind of a complete collapse. And I've told these stories on the podcast before, so I won't dwell on it. But one of the key things was when my, uh, my former wife and I got divorced. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking, how am I supposed to act with this? And then I immediately thought about all the images that, that came to mind of, you know, people being negative and battling yeah. and this uncomfortable energy every time you're at your, your kid's soccer game or hockey game or dance lesson or whatever it might be. And, you know, an acrimonious legal battle and just tension all the time. And that was one of the first times that I sat and I thought about that because I literally I was faced with a situation that I'd never been faced with before and I didn't know how to react. So I thought about it and I, I got those pictures in my mind of what I would consider common. And I thought, well, that's stupid. Why, yeah. why the hell would I want to live like that? Yeah. And that was the start for me of being able to realize what you just said, no, it's just, it's, it's being in every day. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, five o'clock on Friday or it's four 30 on Monday morning and you've just got up, you are where you are. And the, the joy is in getting, is in riding that rhythm and being fully engaged every moment so that you can enjoy where you are not to, cause I was always somewhere else. If I was yeah. with my kids, I thought I should be doing more work. If I was doing work, I felt like I should be with my kids. If I was, you know, on vacation, I was worried about the work that wasn't getting done. If I was, you know what, it's, it's, yeah. it's torture, yeah. and that just describes our North American culture, doesn't it? It sure does. Wow. I hope, you're, I hope your listeners are taking notes because you just dropped a heavy amount of knowledge on them. And being present is obviously, we both know, it's easier said than done. Yeah, great. But if you can just acknowledge that, like, hey, you know what? Let me be present. Let me enjoy this moment, right? I mean, back in the 80s and 90s, before we had iPhones and Xboxes and all sorts of stuff, it was a lot easier to be present because you didn't want to stop hanging out with your kids to play Atari 2600, right? It was, a, it was a line that was going across the screen and hitting a little circle. You know, now we're, we're so overstimulated with all the different things and people have so much more access to us that it's hard to be present. And uh, just last week, I was something, I got an email or something about the Positivity Summit, and uh, my son goes, hey, Daddy, you know, something about my phone, right? And I'm like, I didn't even know my, my phone was out. It was just like, I just took it out, and I was about to check the message, and he said something about my phone, and I just put it in my pocket, and we continue to watch dino trucks. You know, like, I was like, <laughs> dude, this, your kids, you're going to bed in like 8.30, like, it's, like, put your phone away. If it's really that important, you know, they'll call you or whatever. Like, you're good. You don't have to check this mess, this email right now. So I'm with you, brother. I think it's, I think that's such a great point. And 
under, people need to understand we're not saying this like it's an easy thing to do. It, it's not easy to be present. It's not easy to to go to bed late because you're working on something or, or get up really early or start a new exercise routine and you've been out of it for six and seven months. It, none of this is easy, but it's doable. All of it is doable. None of it is impossible. And that's the way I look at life. All of it's doable. If I want to be on Ellen, if I want to be on Oprah, if I want to be whatever, none of that's impossible because people have done it already. It's all doable. And I think if you think of it like that, like if you frame it like that, it's doable. I can lose these 30 pounds. I can get this other job. You know, I can find this other soulmate that will be, you know, amazing in my life. If, it, if you just think of it, it's doable, man, it's going to change the way your mind is and it's going to make your mind stronger. How do you feel, Cornell, about having good things come to you with the backdrop of it sounded like you always had what you needed growing up because of your mom's resourcefulness, mm -hmm. but that it was a struggle sometimes to you know, keep the lights on and do the different things. And I, th I think some people struggle with the idea that, well, having good things and, and good things happen to me is selfish or something like that, um, especially yeah. if they um, grow up in a culture where they accept the idea, you know, it's supposed to be hard. And if it is, if it's easy, then you're a, <laughs> you're a rich snob or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder if you could, because, you know, being rich or being wealthy, people think that just means you have a lot of money. Well, money isn't going to do you any good if you if you don't have any kind of contentment and you aren't having good experiences and relationships. So in my view, it's, it's a lot more than that. But I'm wondering about in your world, Mm-hmm. Was that even something that you had to give conscious attention to, just being good with receiving these good experiences as you worked hard to achieve them? I still do. I still do. I still have to be conscious of it because because I was brought up, it's all the way I was brought up and the way I was raised and the adversity that we went through. I some I have to it's a lot of self-talk for me. Like Cornell, you're giving value. You're helping change people's lives. You're speaking. It's okay to charge this much. It's okay to go here. This isn't a used car salesman, you know, and it, it all, you know, I was talking to someone, they were talking about, you know, moments in our lives and, you know, I had this epiphany. I said, man, it goes back to one real moment for me. And there used to be this older dude, uh, Ed McMahon, and they had this thing called Publishers Clearinghouse. I don't know if you remember it. I sure do. But they'd walk in all these like low income areas, right, with this big freaking check and, you know, they have the video out all the time. And they used to send a check to, you know, they find out who's, you know, probably right by the poverty line. And they send out these things you have to fill out. And if you pay $100 or 50 bucks, then, you know, who knows? Maybe a McMahon will come to your house with some big fake check that you'd never get money for. And, you know, my mom used to get these all the time. And she didn't, you know, really necessarily believe it, but she always filled it out. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And I, it stayed with me. And it never it, – it stayed with me for 30 years. And it came out when I was talking about my speaking. And I was like, wow. It's like I never wanted to be Ed McMahon. Like I never wanted to sell people false hope. And I and I know how much value I give people. And I know that I'm authentic and I'm you know real and all that stuff. But in the back of my mind, that's why it was hard for me to accept you know, people paying me or people – that, it was all because of that moment because I didn't want to sound like a used car salesman, and it it, it takes a while. It takes a while to really get over it and say, you know what, I deserve this, you know, because all, the difference between like you know what you get and what you receive is a lot of times just asking for it, and I wasn't asking for it, and now I'm asking for it, and it yeah, I'm amazed with people, you know, by e how easy it is for people to say, oh yeah, sure, no problem, like it's nothing, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, every every day, Kevin, I something comes up, and you know I do pro bono work still because I love people, and there's places that truly don't have a budget. But if Microsoft is calling me tomorrow to come up, I'm not doing a pro bono <laughs> you know, speech. You know, I'm I'm gonna give them that full ticket price. So uh, yeah, every every day it's it's something that I have to continue to to work on and, and help myself through. What's an example, Cornell, or what immediately comes to mind if I ask you? to describe for me a time that you you were at a certain place or you were having a certain experience that you kind of caught yourself and thought, man, <laughs> this is pretty cool <laughs> that, yeah. that I'm getting to do this. Yeah. Oh, man, there's a lot. But I, I'll tell you, 
the one that sticks out for me is <laughs> I was in England and I was speaking at this basketball banquet and this was probably about two years ago. So I, I was only speaking for about a year or so, but I wrote down on my to-do list. I wanted to speak in England and you know, next thing you know, I'm speaking in England and I'm sitting there. It's probably like 175 people there. And I did about three speeches in all over England. I was in Worcestershire and Essex and Shrewsbury and all these places. And so my last speech was in Worcestershire and I'm speaking and I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm looking at their faces and they're, you know, they, they, they love it. And they're, you know, really responding to what I'm saying, even the jokes. I'm a completely different country. And I just said to myself when I was driving home, you know, I was getting a cab ride home and I said, dude, you just spoke in England. Like that is pretty freaking cool. And I just, it just, I mean, the whole flight, I was just in a, in like a really good fog, like. I just spoke in England, you know, so that was probably one of the, you know, outside of my books coming out, that was probably one of the, the times where I just, it's almost like un- surreal where you're just like, well, I'm in another country right now sharing my message. And a year and a half ago, I wanted to be a division one basketball coach. Well, it's not that I'm glad that you're not a coach. <laughs> but I'm uh, on behalf of the rest of all of us in the world. I'm I'm thrilled that you're doing what you're doing now, and I, I think we need more like you. And I hope that you'll consider me a cheerleader and a supporter in whatever way I can be there for you and to help amplify your message. With that in mind, what are some of the ways that people can get to know Cornell Thomas a little bit? What would you recommend? Well, thanks first off, Kevin. I'll you know obviously big fan now of yours and going to support everything that you do. So I appreciate that. Uh, For me, you can find me under Cornell Thomas on pretty much anything. So Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, I think it's Cornell Thomas 34, which is my basketball number. And, uh, you know, I do Facebook lives. I give out a lot of free content every single day. So if you're following me, you're going to get some quotes, you're going to get some videos, you're going to get some things that can help you. And if you, you know, if you go to my website, uh, Cornell-Thomas.com, you'll see another gazillion things about me and speaking and coaching. So uh, feel free to say hi. I respond very quick. So don't be surprised when you message me and you get a message right back saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? Tell me your story. So, um, yeah, that's how you get in contact with me. Before I let you go, how tall are you? I am six foot five. Oh, man, that's going to be a little tough. I'm maybe yeah. um, I'm maybe five eight. Maybe pull okay. another half out of there if I put on my platform shoes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I put on some D light and then I uh, get those yeah. shoes going. <laughs> but I love it. Yeah. Well, we're back to the hammer pants again, right? And yeah. shortly after yeah. that, I love but, the rubber. Uh, well, we're from similar eras, Cornell, and you wouldn't necessarily know it to look at me, but basketball was always the sport that I loved most. And when I got oh. to about great, and I'm I'm better at it than than you would think <laughs> if you yeah. were to look at me. Well, uh, but I'm certainly not going to be holding down the power forward position. But, no. uh, yeah, from grade 7, <laughs> grade 8, and then getting all through high school, just there was something almost it's, – it's almost like a meditation, sh- mm-hmm. you know, just being out and shooting and just that sound that the net makes when you just hit it perfect, that you could yeah. just do it for hours and hours and hours. And I, I can't think of anything else – when I was younger that I put that much time into, I didn't have the same goal as you did, but certainly a a love for the game. And um, at some point or another, I'm betting our travels are going to match up either by chance or by choice. And there'll be a court, there'll be a court somewhere. I don't know that I'm going to challenge you to a game of one-on-one because I'm (laughs) going to have to run through your legs and distract you. Somebody send him an email because I know that he can't leave it without responding. And that's when I'm going to drive to the basket. Because I, I I do have a left hand, so that's good. But uh, I, I I hope we get to do that one day. Yeah, Kev, where 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 are you located? I'm in London, Ontario, Canada. So about uh, two hours from Detroit. You know what's funny? I will be in Toronto in the next three and a half weeks. Yeah, I I, I made a note of that, and we're going to talk about that after we wrap yep. up. <laughs> sure, for sure. <laughs> so. it's funny how the universe works, my friend. Cornell's new book is called Extraordinary, The Distance Between Good and Great, and you can find it on Amazon, along with his previous books, The Power of Positivity and The Power of Me. 
His podcast is called Population Unplugged. I highly recommend it. You can find it on iTunes and on Stitcher. And you can connect with and follow along with Cornell online. His website is cornell-thomas.com. His first name is C-O-R-N-E-L-L. Thomas, just like you would think, T-H-O-M-A-S, cornell-thomas.com. On Instagram, he's at cornellthomas34. Twitter, at cornellthomas. His Facebook fan page is facebook.com slash positivity guru. And his personal Facebook feed is cornellthomas.96, which I would highly recommend you go and follow or friend him. He's usually in there with a positive quote at least once a day and a Facebook live video more days than not as well. It's all great stuff. You'll find them both helpful and positive additions to your social media news feed. As for me, my website is kevinbulmer.com. My last name is B as in Bob, U-L-M-E-R. No schedule man.com takes you to the same place. And if you'd like to connect on social media, let's do that. I'm at no schedule man on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. So if you can remember no schedule man, I'm easy to find. And you can find the podcast directly at no schedule man podcast. Dot com. Now, if you like this episode and would like more examples of the power of positivity, you'll probably like these ones as well. Episode 39, it's called Run Toward the Roar with Martin Reed. He tells some incredible stories of personal reinvention and focusing on love and positivity to move him forward. The same with Michael Doyle, episode 44, it's called Living Fully. And Steve Zanella has a really inspiring story about overcoming anxiety in episode 45. I encourage you to look for all of those and more. And you can find all other archived episodes of Journeys with the No Schedule Man on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or at no schedule man podcast. Com. You can also learn more about my speaking, workshops, seminars, and coaching at that website. And if you feel any of those would be a good fit for your business or organization, I hope you'll pass the word along and or get in touch with me personally. That'd be even better. I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen and to share part of your day with me. Next week, we'll be back with all new episodes, and we've got some really great stories to share in the coming weeks. I hope you'll come back. And bring friends. All are welcome to be a part of Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Just a little deja vu. 